how they affect the people of Indiana. Here's your moderator, Larry Law. Today we're going to talk about AIDS. How far have we come medically, socially, in dealing with this disease? We have two special guests with us today on Public Affairs Roundtable. They are Lillian Goosen, who is with the Food and Drug Administration as Consumer Affairs Officer working in Indiana and Michigan, and Dr. Charles Barrett, who is Director of the Chronic and Communicable Diseases Division of the State Board of Health here in Indiana, and John Rouse, Producer of Public Affairs Roundtable and a Professor of public uh, Political Science at Ball State University. John, an overview on AIDS. Uh, obviously, there's been some hysteria associated with it. There's been talk of legislation, the political end of it that has become a political issue. Is AIDS going to be, in fact, an issue in which politics plays a part? I think it depends uh, in terms of the evidence that uh, our guests give us, uh, and it is very difficult to give an overview of AIDS. The best overview in terms of the fear of this uh, disease, I think, comes from a fellow by the name of Stephen Chapman. He's a columnist for the Chicago Tribune, and he asked the question, why do so many people, despite the evidence, react in such a violent way to AIDS? And he says it's more than just the fear of dying. Uh, uh, for example, we experience uh, a whole number of things in society from which we could die. We get in our cars and we drive. We eat hamburgers then. Apparently hamburgers have fat foods in them, and that's dangerous for us, and that could cause heart attacks, and we could die from that. We could even take a shower and flip in the shower. But, but he asked the question, Stephen Chapman of the Chicago Tribune, why are people so afraid of this disease? He, uh, he says there are three factors. He says, first of all, uh, that uh, certain persons in society have a uh, concern of homophobia. Homophobia, homophobia, a difficult word for me even to pronounce, apparently is a fear of homosexuals. And that there is a disgust and hatred by many Americans for homosexuals. And uh, this is something that, that goes towards the focus that God is somehow, or nature is somehow punishing homosexuals. That's the first point that Chapman makes. A second point that Chapman makes is that this is a gay disease and that this di a disease raises many irrational fears. And uh, for example, uh, uh, Chapman gives the uh, story uh, by the comedian uh, Murphy uh, who says that uh, uh, the person goes to the doctor and the doctor s says that he has AIDS. A and the, the person says, well, doctor, I'm not a homosexual. And, 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 and the doctor says in a patronizing kind of way, well, of course we know you're not a homosexual. So really, it's, it's no fun to be dead, but it's even m less fun to be dead and be suspected of homosexuality because that's really intolerable. So that's the second point that Chapman makes. The, the third point that Chapman makes in his article is that uh, it's more complicated than all this. Uh, we have to drive, and it's necessary to drive. And it's enjoyable to eat cheeseburgers, but there's no benefit from having any kind of contact with a person who has AIDS. So this gives kind of an overview, I think, in terms of the hysteria but behind the AIDS uh, uh, scare in this country. Dr. Barrett, uh, Indiana has had to deal with the Ryan White issue. Has the Ryan White issue helped or hurt people's acceptability of this disease? Well, I believe overall uh, it has helped because it has uh, uh, been uh, a, uh, uh, a spark, uh, an issue to uh, focus on in um, and getting information out about AIDS uh, to the people of Indiana. And I believe um, our uh, uh, educational program in the state may be further along uh, as a result of that case. Certainly that case has had many negative aspects and uh, many people uh, I think will, will never be uh, convinced of, of the uh, safety of, of allowing a child with AIDS to uh, attend a, a regular school program. But I think on balance, uh, it has uh, uh, also done, done a lot of good in terms of providing an added impetus and opportunity to, uh, to get the word out to, to people in Indiana. What is the 
educational process? What is being done to educate people about AIDS? Well, we have a, uh, a full-time um, AIDS education staff at the State Board of Health uh, consisting uh, right now of, um, of four people. Uh, they're not doing just AIDS education, but that's their primary uh, uh, focus, and uh, uh, they are uh, continually traveling about the state, uh, uh, speaking to various groups uh, about AIDS. Uh, they've produced um, a number of uh, uh, pamphlets and other uh, written uh, literature, and of course we're getting uh, information of that type from the uh, federal level as well, which our staff is uh, distributing uh, widely. Uh, they are uh, soon to be making a, uh, uh, a videotape, which will, we hope will be uh, aired widely uh, here and there uh, about AIDS. And uh, uh, also, um, uh, they are beginning the process of doing a number of, of surveys, which are going to tell us uh, just what knowledge uh, people in Indiana have about AIDS, what their attitudes are towards the disease and the people that have it, and not only the uh, uh, general public, but um, people who are in the so-called high-risk groups for AIDS uh, will also be uh, uh, surveyed in that manner. And then later on, we're going to do follow-up surveys and determine whether uh, there, there have been changes in uh, that knowledge and those attitudes. What's the message in the education that the, that the people who tried to keep Ryan White out of school were wrong, that in fact this is not a highly contagious disease? What is the message? What is the one thing that you're trying to get across in, in the process? Well, those certainly are the, uh, are the facts that AIDS is not a highly contagious disease. Of course, it's uh, uh, transmitted in... Um, ways which are now uh, very well defined uh, through sexual contact, heterosexual as well as homosexual contact, uh, through blood exposure uh, such as uh, occurs when intravenous drug abusers share contaminated needles among themselves, and formerly uh, also occurred uh, in a um, relatively small number of cases when uh, contaminated blood transfusions were given or when uh, contaminated blood products were used, such as in the treatment of, of hemophilia. Now, these latter uh, categories have uh, uh, been pretty well eliminated with the, uh, the measures that are now being used to uh, uh, control transmission through the blood supply. Um, and, of course, the third uh, uh, identified mode of transmission is, is perinatal, that is, uh, from a, um, a mother um, to her unborn infant before it is born or at the time uh, it, it is born. And, uh, of course, most of the cases in children have, have occurred in, uh, in that manner. So those are, are the, the facts about the transmission and the facts that uh, uh, it is not transmitted through so-called casual contact, that is, the normal sorts of, uh, of contacts that people have in their uh, in their day-to-day -day lives, and, and certainly not in the um, in the classroom at school. You're dealing with the with the problem of hysteria. Then is is, is that what it is? Yes, and uh, uh, I I would have to say that I think it's understandable. Certainly, that uh, uh, people have a great deal of of concern about this disease, and it's just unfortunate that uh, uh, hysteria does seem to prevail in some circumstances, and uh, uh, prevents the uh, uh, the message of the of the facts uh, from uh, getting across it as well as we would like, but we feel that we we just have to keep um, reiterating these facts uh, over and over. And uh, uh, certainly, our our staff has found in their travels around the state and the various um, sessions and programs that they have with different groups that, uh, uh, by and large. Uh, the uh, uh, status of, of knowledge and understanding of AIDS uh, does seem to be improving. Charles, if, if I can interrupt just a second, I was, I was trying out my hysteria theories that I just mentioned on a colleague this morning, and he said, and he was referen referencing his own two children, and he says, well, what if all the bright boys are wrong? 
And so it seems, that, and the bright boys, meaning the people, the experts, he says, what if all the experts are wrong? And here is a, a PhD at Ball State University asking these kinds of questions. If he's asking these kinds of questions, how do you get underneath this, this real hysteria that we talked about earlier in the program? Uh, you see what I mean? Well, yes, and that, that is uh, certainly the root of the problem that, uh, that we're dealing with uh, to a large degree uh, an emotional reaction to the disease rather than a uh, uh, rational uh, uh, understanding uh, of, of the facts. And uh, uh, I think it's, uh, it's going to take uh, a great deal more time before um, that type of problem is uh, uh, to, a, uh, to a large extent uh, resolved, but we can, uh, we can only keep uh, uh, working at it and, uh, and trying to, uh, to get the message across. So we've had uh, now uh, around 25,000 cases uh, nationally um, and uh, a, a great deal of, uh, of um, follow-up, uh, gathering information on those cases that has been done. Our own staff is involved in that at the State Board of Health. Uh, all uh, state and large city uh, health departments are performing uh, those activities and uh, uh, providing this information to the Centers for Disease Control. So there's a, there's a considerable wealth of information upon which these judgments are based. And not only that, um, special uh, uh, studies which have been done in a variety of settings, and certainly one of the most important uh, settings uh, in regard to the uh, particular question we're, we're discussing uh, is the study of uh, household contacts of AIDS cases in uh, uh, well over a hundred uh, homes in which uh, um, AIDS uh, uh, cases reside. The uh, other household members have been uh, followed up, tested uh, on, uh, on a repeated basis. Now that we have the antibody test, we don't have to wait four or five years or longer for AIDS to develop to know if uh, someone has been infected. Uh, you can test their blood for the development of the antibody, which uh, uh, generally becomes positive within a period of uh, 12 weeks uh, after infection and uh, more likely would be within, say, two or three weeks or something like that, that, uh, that they would turn positive. So you can follow them at very close intervals to see if they have become infected. And none of these individuals living in the household, even uh, taking care of uh, infants and very small children with AIDS, with the kind of problems they have in terms of, of control of their bowel functions and so forth, um, there, there have been no uh, uh, infections uh, documented uh, in these household uh, uh, situations uh, unless the person also had contact by one of the uh, uh, means of transmission that I enumerated earlier, sexual contact uh, in, in particular. Uh, so all of this is, uh, is very reassuring, and the uh, uh, evidence uh, uh, that continues to come out um, just adds, adds greater, uh, greater support to the uh, positions that we've taken. Lillian Goosens, where does the Food and Drug Administration fit into the study coordination education process? Well, a little bit all over the place. Um, we do education, and we have um, a slideshow also that uh, we've worked with from CDC. And I, too, go around the state giving presentations on AIDS. And I think one of the things that uh, I could reinforce from Dr. Barrett's uh, statement was the, the case of the people in the same home where there is an AIDS patient that one of the easiest ways to, uh, to disinfect things is good old household bleach because uh, I know I was getting called and they said, I'm sure that young man is a homosexual and I have to use his phone and I, I don't want to sit next to him in the office and, you know, we're in a carpool. I, I left the carpool and we were going through this little hysteria. So I simply suggested she take a small bottle of bleach and wash off the phone. I mean, if that was her problem, but I kept telling her it's not the way it's transmitted. You know, and you're not going to get a shaking hand or using the phone. You're going to have to have a much more direct exchange of fluids, either 
you know, with the needle inserting it or through sex or something like that. And, and I think when they finally calm down and they get the message uh, that it really isn't going to hurt to sit at the next desk if, if this person indeed does have AIDS, which they don't know for sure, uh, you know, it, it sort of calms them down. That bleach, which is very common to everybody, can actually get rid of it for them on the telephone. And, and that seemed to solve a lot of problems in a few weeks on the phone there with questions. Uh, food and drug also has the responsibility of keeping the blood supply uh, safe because we are the final word on the safety of the blood supply. And in less than two years, we did come up with CDC and all the other researchers uh, on a test for AIDS in the blood supply. And I think in doing that in two years' time, that, that was really phenomenal because if you think of all the research that goes on normally for years and years and years with infectious diseases, that was an incredible happening. Uh, to come up with something to test blood and to to segregate the blood supply. That, that was phenomenal. The other thing Food and Drug is doing is giving orphan drug status to promising drugs. Now, orphan drug status is where uh, manufacturers get tax breaks, get grant money, and get seven years exclusive marketing for a product in the marketplace in addition to the 17-year patent so that they can make some money back. And we have given orphan uh, drug status to things like AZT, so that even though this drug had been around before, it was applied in a new way, and it was sort of reworked, if you will, and it's now into clinical study phases. What is AZT? Well, I, I always have to write down the full big word. <laughs> it's azdifimidine, and it's an antiviral compound. And it um, has been around for almost 20 years in experimental stages for one thing and another. And what it actually does is inhibit the infection with AIDS, and it also stops it or inhibits it, inhibit it, inhibits it that's hard to say today, uh, in reproducing itself. Because as you probably are well aware from all the things that have been written on AIDS, the viral infection goes inside the cell, and it actually has to depend on the function of the cell itself to reproduce. It has its own genetic network, but it can't live outside that cell too well. So that it, it really is dependent on the body's cell. And it seems to attack the, the part of the cell that gives a human immunity to so many things. So that then the AIDS patient uh, isn't always down with cancer or always down with uh, different rare types of pneumonia, but rather he is is able to get almost anything because he has no resistance to anything, whether it's a, a, a foot fungus or, or anything else you might think of. Well, well AZT then is not really a cure. It just deals no. with some of the, it delays. It delays it, and what it seems to do is inhibit its reproducing. Now, whether or not that will lead to a cure, the fact that they can stop it from reproducing, you still have that main infection. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I was going to ask a, a pretty similar question. So, so, so the point we should make is that AZT, the abbreviation for the big word, is is really not a cure. It's just something that allows a, an AIDS victim perhaps to live longer, and that would al allow the chance to have a, a solution to the problem or find a solution to the disease. Is, is, is that, that uh, that's that's essentially correct? Essentially it's it. not a cure. We have some 21 drugs that are being looked at and that are in various stages of clinical studies. They're all working on the AIDS problem in one form or another. And of course, it depends a little bit on, on the individual and what they've come down with. If they've come down with a cancerous type uh, form uh, you know, or attack with AIDS, then you might want to do one thing with them. If it's the pneumonia, then you want AZT. If it's something else, then, you know, you're looking at different kinds of response medicines. But thus far, there is nothing that really kills the AIDS virus per se, so that we can inhibit its reproduction a little bit, uh, we can slow it down, but we don't have a cure at this point. Well, now, now this brings up another point. In, in, in preparation for this program, I had to do some research of my own, of course, and it implied that education was an answer, but, but uh, uh, but there was also the implication that, that education would not be the complete answer because there is yet no 
answer for this drug. There's uh, no medical answer for there, it. There, really. Yeah, there's no medical answer to it. Well, I, well, I, we follow up the question: How how, how will education uh, help beyond the obvious kinds of things that we've discussed thus far on the program? Well, I think education will help um, in the sense of if you are an an at risk person in your sexual habits, that then you do want to discuss it with someone in the medical community of barriers for protection of yourself and your partner. I think that would be one thing that uh, would be done, and certainly CDC has put out a lot of material on this. I think uh, hygienic habits are going to become paramount in many ways. Uh, I also think that you're going to have to look at various other aspects that the government normally does not get into, and I don't believe we'll get into at this point, but it's probably going to be with um, in a sense, self-denial or self-regulation of yourself and what you choose to do. And that this is, is something that's extremely difficult. You can talk about it, you can tell people about it, but you can't make them do it in a free society. Well, the high-risk people then ought to live in a little bit of fear. Yeah, right. I can see where you would have some definite fear. Uh, but then when you, when you look at that risk group, and, you, and the one subgroup I think that education won't have any effect on, uh, and maybe it's because of my past experience of living and working in San Francisco, I don't know, but that would be the drug users. Uh, when they want to get a high on, or whatever the term is now, uh, and they exchange needles and so forth, there really is no common sense attitude of, of breaking that. I mean, they want it, they want it right then, and they don't care. You know, they're driven by another force. And I think that's that's going to be extremely difficult to deal with. I don't know how you deal with that unless you um, clean them up, is the term we used to use, you know, get them off drugs. And, and that's been around for a long time, and I don't know if that's going to really happen. I think the other thing we have to look at is with the heterosexual exchange of AIDS, and perhaps Dr. Bear could address this, I know, from maybe the State Board of Health, but from CDC we were looking at the pediatrics cases we're expecting by 1990 for the whole country. Uh, and then the, some of the unknowns with these pediatric cases. These kids are born with it. Uh, we can get them to live, and maybe they'll survive till 20 years of age. But what happens then? What do you do then? What do you do at age 15? Yes, I, I noticed the projection was by 1991 that 9% of all those with, with AIDS would be het heterosexuals. Mm -hmm. Is that? Yeah, well, the, the infant cases, I think, if they live, Mm -hmm. which, is, which is another big question, um, will make that figure even larger. Yeah. If I could quickly look at some of the political, uh, the, the global political concerns is that old issue in American life of majority uh, will and minority rights. Mm -hmm. And that's a very key issue coming up right now in a global sense in terms of what, what kinds of rights do the minority who have this disease have in terms of having contact with the majority. Looking at it in terms of a more narrow political perspective, it was asked, for example, uh, if, if this disease had affected uh, members of the Chamber of Commerce, would the Reagan administration have come forth more with more funding in terms of research? For example, last year, Procter & Gamble spent between 15 and 60 million dollars to produce a new liquid tide. Crest Toothpaste spent 30 million dollars just to produce another kind of formula. The Public Health Service also spent $30 million to address the issue of AIDS. So from a more narrow political perspective, it's a matter of how much money we put behind the research uh, focus. Well, part of this, you have to realize, is in those tax breaks, the exclusive marketing rights and so forth in the orphan drug deal that we make, uh, for instance, with uh, a drug company to develop and do the clinical studies. All of that is not in that figure, and that does add up to a lot of money. Mm -hmm. So we're doing it perhaps in a way that isn't as straightforward as Procter & Gamble's budget, where they're just doing advertising and product development. We have to do a lot of clinical research, and the money is spread out between drug firms, the government, and tax breaks. So it's, it's quite a different kind of budgeting. Okay. But until we can, I guess, tell people that there is there's really nothing to be afraid of. I mean, can we can we tell them that now that they don't have 
there's no fear whatsoever that a blood transfusion is going to give them AIDS. I mean, can we tell them absolutely, like John said, can we, can we say positively that the big boys are absolutely right, that there are no other means, you cannot transmit this disease through teardrops or perhaps saliva? Uh, can we be that sure? Well, this is something, of course, that uh, is a matter of uh, uh, a great deal of um, uh, continued research, and uh, but a great deal of research has already been done with uh, with no indication whatsoever that uh, uh, AIDS uh, uh, has uh, other modes of, of transmission that we don't know about. Certainly, we'll keep following up uh, that issue to. Uh, uh, to um, find out if that situation might change, but at, at the present, um, we can uh, can certainly be reassuring, or at least try to be reassuring to people from that standpoint. Are politicians who are urging, or who are making AIDS an issue in their campaigns in terms of perhaps segregation, are they playing on the fears of people? Are they being irresponsible? Well, I think uh, uh, to... Uh, to some extent, that uh, um, I would have I would have to say yes uh, to, to that uh, to that question. Uh, certainly, there will be situations uh, in which uh, isolation or segregation or quarantine of, of a person uh, will become necessary. If you have someone, for example, a uh, a uh, homosexual prostitute who continues to ply their trade in a very blatant nature even though they've been warned many times and, and they're still spreading the infection to people, it may become necessary at some point uh, to take some very vigorous restrictive measures uh, against that, that type of person. But of course, uh, I would hope those would be very rare uh, cases. And the message here today is that we don't think we really have that much to worry about if we watch ourselves, if we're not the high-risk people. That's right. If you, if you use good hygiene and you use common sense in your uh, activities with other people sexually, that uh, you should come out just okay, fine. No worries. All right, we're out of time today. Thanks to our panelists, Dr. Charles Bear from the State Board of Health, Lillian Goosens from the Federal Dr Food and Drug Administration, excuse me, and John Rouse. I'm Larry Law. Thank you for being with us. If you have comments regarding this program, please address them to John Ross, Box 149, Muncie, Indiana, 47305. The producer for Public Affairs Roundtable is John Ross. Associate producers are Cecil Bohannon and Bill Mosier. This program is a production of University Media Services, the Department of Political Science, and radio and television stations on the campus of Ball State University in Muncie, Indiana.